In association with Bonhams, we are very excited to be here at the Haynes Motor Museum to get a privileged view of a unique collection of machines that are due to be entered in the autumn Stafford sale 2022. We're going to be talking to Ben from Bonhams and Dave, who works here at the museum, who's going to talk us through some of these very special machines. So, Ben. Hey. Good to see you again. Good to see you too. Isn't it lovely to be in this space? Superb. Uh, I mean, it's 25 years that the bikes have been here now on display. And I think it's quite sad that, you know, that's coming to an end and they're going to be dispersed. Mm. But it's all going to happen at Stafford on the 16th of October. Stafford, which I know lots of people watching this are going to be familiar with. Mm -hmm. And it should be an exciting day, not least because, you know, just the rarity and the variety and so unusual to have a collection of speedway machines and such significant speedway machines in an auction. In fact, probably not since we had the Ivor Major collection have mm. we had anything as special as, as this collection. And I think in particular when we were talking about, so this is the Foreshore collection, and when we heard at the channel that it was going to be a collection of speedway bikes, my initial reactions were, all right, okay, that's quite interesting. And then when we saw some of these at the Banbury Room, when you brought some there to see the pre-war post-vintage machines, my eyes lit up. And that's, for me, what makes this so special. And, well, we well, can see here. It's amazing what Richard Forshaw achieved. He's got everything here right from the very early days of Speedway through to the, to the present day and, and the sort of modern incarnation of, of a Speedway motorcycle. Very, very focused man. I mean, yeah. it's extraordinary to look at his history files, which have been really, really privileged to spend time with. I mean, you know, part of my job is not just looking at the, the metal, it's also looking at the paperwork and the paper trails and trying to um, deconstruct and disseminate and get the salient points on, on the history of these bikes. Yeah. And Richard was a prolific writer with his with his father as well captain Forshaw, um the two of them were absolutely were clearly passionate about speedway and he researched he wrote to again when you think about the time he was buying these bikes so mm -hmm. the collection started would have started in the mid 1980s yep and he was buying these bikes at a time where there perhaps wasn't as great a appreciation for for what they what they represented certainly not the level that we have today in no. 2022 and he was able to contact people who were alive at the time that these machines were being he knew them raced. In period and could inform him and absolutely, yeah, yeah. yeah. and it's just marvellous to sort of pick up letters and actually have first-hand um, experiences and history on some of these motorcycles. So one of the machines that's really caught my eye is this instantly recognisable in that colour scheme, Indian, very special machine, I believe. Yeah, very special machine. It's been quite a task unravelling the history of that motorcycle, but what we do have is a magnificent paper trail. And from what I've been able to establish, it is, in all probability, the Art Pika, I hope I'm saying that correctly, it might be Peacher, but the American Art Pika, one of the great early Speedway riders, um, that was one of the machines that he brought over in 1928 and set records on at Stamford Bridge at the time. I mean, it really, you know, Fantastic, this caused yeah. a sensation. It's a really um, competitive machine. Really competitive really. machine. And he, um, you know, the audience, you've got to remember, Speedway in those early days, even in those early days, it was attracting huge audiences, filling mm. stadiums. And these guys were international, international stars. What's really interesting about this bike is that Richard bought it as in a, in a fairly dilapidated state, um, missing its saddle, missing its handlebars. And of course, he then starts to do the research and he managed to speak to the person or have, get a letter from the person who owned it, bought it in 1934. <laughs> so yeah. I've got a first-hand account yeah. of this motorcycle. And he bought it, and, and to quote the letter, from a couple of aspiring Speedway stars. Now, I don't know who those gentlemen were, Okay. But in that letter, it says, I bought this as the Art Pika motorcycle. The other great thing is Jeff Clue, who, the late Jeff Clue, fantastic guy, good personal friend of mine, he was also in correspondence with Richard about this motorcycle. And we've got a letter on file from 1986 where Jeff's been in correspondence with um, Charles Shuka in America. Again, I hope I'm saying his surname correctly. Uh, the great Indian historian 
where he says it is undoubtedly a factory frame wow. for this motorcycle. Okay. Um, so again, you know, two really fantastic primary bits of evidence uh, for this motorcycle. Richard then, of course, embarked on a restoration, very, very particular restoration. He went to great lengths to find correct handlebars for it. Yeah, they're uh, quite unusual compared to the rest of the bikes, actually, aren't they? So they're quite distinctive. Well, he, he, I can tell you now, it took a long time for him to find those. Yeah. Uh, likewise, the saddle was made to, uh, um, you know, an accurate copy of what it would have originally had. <laughs> Uh, the owner of the bike in 1934 confirmed that the bike was as he had it in 1934. It survived, a remarkable survivor. Wasn't abused, wasn't chopped about, didn't have the engine taken out and the frame used for other purposes. So exciting, exciting to have the motorcycle in the auction and the estimate on that bike is 90 to 120,000 pounds. Wow, but it is a very special machine. It's good, I mean, myself, to see one with that full loop frame, which you recognize with those American machines, but not being a board track racer, actually a proper dirt bike, speedway bike, really is interesting to see and I think yeah. it stands out. And it's a 350 engine, of course, yeah. which um, is similar, but not the same to the Prince engine. And if you look at catalog images, and again, Richard had, of course he had, copies of original catalogs on file for it. Um, you can see that it is the correct engine for that frame, extremely rare. So moving from this American-made machine to a, a British bike, a little bit unusual in this collection to see uh, a twin-cylinder machine, actually, and a very early one, circa 1928. Yeah, twin-cylinder and a two-speed. And it's great to have uh, a Douglas in the collection because, of course, it's a local machine yep. made in Bristol. A no-speedway collection would be complete without an example of one of these DTs. No, they were great for grass track racing and, and speedway, as you mentioned. And estimate on this one? Well, a very reasonable 12 to 16,000 pounds. And we've got some great footage of one of these running at the Malay Mile from earlier in the year. So, fantastic machine. So, moving along from the Douglas to a single cylinder bike. Norton at the top there. Yep, another really unusual motorcycle. Again, so rare. Uh, I believe that there were somewhere between 11 and 13 examples produced wow. by the factory. Um, looking at the records that I've seen, there were a couple of engines as well. Okay. But based on the pushrod engine, overhead valve, I understand that it wasn't very easy to ride. Okay, bit unwieldy um, that one. Bit unwieldy, yeah. quite heavy. Um, and I think that's probably the reason why they didn't make many more than sort of 11 to 13 examples of them. That is catalogue specification, confirmed as being one of the original Norton Speedway motorcycles. Genuine article. Genuine article. 1930, is it? Circa, 19, circa 1930. Yep. So I believe that the design was started in 1929 and they produced them in 1930. That one went to Holland and was in family ownership from, I believe, the mid-1930s. Uh, the family were also Wall of Death riders, <laughs> really? so, uh, as well as being Speedway riders. But really great history, very well-known motorcycle, very nicely restored. And the estimate for the Norton is 14 to 18,000 pounds, which I think is a very fair estimate when you consider the price of sort of CS1s and Inters. Yeah. It's a lot rarer and really does need to be in a uh, I'm sure there's some dedicated Norton guys out there who will want to own that motorcycle. It's really interesting to see that sort of Model 18 engine, style engine, in that form. It still retains that pie crusting around the bottom of the yeah, tail. Yeah, I know. Right? Isn't it beautiful? It's so Norton still, but yep. very unusual to see one laid out like that, like you yep. say. And uh, another unusual sight, to see a BSA as a dirt track bike as well. I know, I know, I know. It's, again, another rarity. They just weren't as successful as the uh, Rudges or the Douglases. I can't tell you off the top of my head what the production numbers were for the BSA, but again, it's going to be very, very limited. Mm. Uh, and the estimate on this machine is eight to 12,000 pounds, which again, for the dedicated BSA uh, collector, I think is very attractive. Yeah, to get something like that in your collection. You're not going to come along another one nope. <laughs> anytime soon, are you, nope. for sure? So from these two British bikes back to what many will see is possibly the star attraction here, something very, very special. Mm. This American machine, 
I know the name on the tank. I've yep. never seen a single cylinder one before. No, no. Obviously, the big V-twins that we've seen in some of the Bonhams auctions in the States attract huge interest and mm. huge values. But this, this is something, yeah, very special. Well, it's half a twin. So it's not going to have quite the same value as, a, as one, of the, one no, of the big twins. No. But this is where Crocker started. Okay. Um, before they were producing the big V-twins, they were producing dirt track bikes. Right. And again, the lovely thing about this machine is it's got a very, very complete history. In fact, we know who the original rider was, who was wow. a chap called Red Rice. Love that. And um, from Red Rice, it passed through a number of collectors' hands in the Seattle area before it went into the ownership of a guy called Pete Gagan, uh, former uh, chairman and president, I believe, of the Ameri Antique Motorcycle Club of America. Okay. Um, very well-known figure and personality, great, great guy. Pete swapped it with Richard for a Brough Superior. Wow. <laughs> That's how badly uh, Richard wanted to have yeah, a Crocker yeah. in his collection. Fantastic. Now, I can't tell you how many of these survive, but we are talking a handful, probably less than, less than a dozen. Um, maybe even maybe even single figures. Um, and is this I, a genuine yes. factory frame? We believe it's all For absolutely. Wow. Um, okay. Again, described by by Pete Gagan as being one of the most original extants. The saddle has been recovered. Mm -hmm. um, the saddle is an original modification by Red Rice. Okay. Um, but otherwise, it is stock catalog specification. Unfortunately. Okay. When, um, again, Richard bought this back in the mid-1990s. And at the time, there was a VHS tape with a recording of the original rider oh, talking wow. about his motorcycle. Okay. We've not been able to find it. But it's out there somewhere. It's out there it somewhere. Out there I've somewhere. said to the family oh. to search the <laughs> attic, to look for that recording. I've even reached out to Pete in America um, he's yet to get back to me. So, Pete, if you're watching this, I really hope, you know, <laughs> give me a shout. I'd really love to find that oh, VHS wow. tape. Um, but in all the paperwork and documentation, it says all the way along with the recording of the original rider of the motorcycle talking about his bike. Oh, <sighs> so there's still a bit more. But the history that comes with this is pretty... Oh, yes, yeah, solid. ...complete, yes. isn't it? And it's yes, a known yes, machine. Yes. Again, I mean, the extraordinary thing about all these bikes is the level of research that Richard went into. I mean, it's remarkable. I haven't seen anything like it before. Fantastic. And that's saying something. I mean, I've been doing yeah. this for sort of 22, 23 years. Yeah. <laughs> and the files on all of these bikes, he really did take the time to establish the facts and sort out the best and went after them and spent years. I mean, it took him years to acquire this bike, to mm. prize it out of Pete and Pete Gagan is, a, is one of the very well-known big American collectors. And like I say, it took a broth superior to yeah. acquire that, that motorcycle. Probably not many of these in Europe, let alone in America then. So it's, no. like you say, handful left. Is it 500, this bike? It's is 500, it? yeah. 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 Difficult to know where the value is going to be on that. I can tell you the estimate's 100 to 140,000 pounds, which when you consider that the twins are now selling for... Three hundred, four hundred, five hundred, six hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Um, looks like great value. It's a bargain. <laughs> Does look like a bargain, doesn't it? Um, but I really, I just don't know. It's a bit like the Indian. It's these are all. I've got no precedent. No, with, no. With with many of these Not bikes. Seen them before. Yeah. No, really. When they come up for sale at Stafford, is where we will find out what the actual values are. Two beautiful examples here of what pre-war and post-war Excelsior. Pre-war and post-war Excelsiors. Uh, again, very beautifully presented, very keenly estimated, uh, five to seven thousand pounds and seven to ten thousand pounds for the pre-war machine. Again, I expect a lot of interest in those at that kind of level. Um, restored, again, Richard Forshaw restoration, lots of attention to detail, and yeah, beautifully presented. Yeah, excellent. But there's another pair of bikes over here, the Wallaces that I've seen, and they've really caught my eye. They're probably my favourites of the whole collection, to be honest, Ben. Are we going to talk about those? Let's have a look. So these Wallace machines, a brand I'd never heard of before, but we saw the one with the blue tank at Banbury, but there's also one here with a red tank. So mm -hmm. very similar machines, but both using different proprietary engines. Yep, yep. So you've got the dog-eared Jap, and you've got the overhead Blackburn engine in that one. Again, there is going to be some good history, which will be in the catalogue descriptions, which will all be up online approximately two to three weeks before the sale date. 
Um, that one was subject to an article, Jeff Clue article, in the Classic Motorcycle, which uh, okay. James Robinson and Jane Scaman have kindly provided me a, a copy of. Um, this bike, there is not quite as much detail on, but uh, hopefully, again, when the catalogue comes out, I'm sure there'll be people coming forwards with some more details as to the, as to the uh, background and where they were found, so on and so forth. Right. Each is estimated at 10 to 15,000 pounds. Fabulous and some superb detail. I love the front forks and the suspension on those. Uh, mm. Superb, really caught my eye. But then, nestled in the middle, we've got this unusual bike. I know. A two-stroke. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Scott, uh, two-stroke. Again, I believe it's a very correct bike. Um, spoken to the guys at the Scott Club, Martin Heckshire, who is one of our consultants, is also heavily involved with Scott's. Yep. Um, he's had a good look at that for us. And I believe that's a, a correct frame. Um, you'll notice it is very similar to the sprint frame. Mm. Um, and I believe that it was the dirt track frame which was the basis for the sprint frame. But Martin is really the man um, to, to tell all about that motorcycle and he'll be at the sale. So if anyone does want to find out more okay, about it, come and, come and chat to Martin. Yeah, estimate on that is six to 8,000 pounds. Moving on to these two unrestored bikes, but they have a link to each other, don't they, Ben? Well, if you look at the frames, they are very, very similar. Um, this is a Rudge. Okay. Uh, it's, you know, it was an all-conquering motorcycle back in the early days of Speedway. Very, very successful. Mm -hmm. This is a Victor Martin. Same frame, but with a Jap engine in it. Right. And Victor Martin got agreement from Rudge to build their frames under license but fitted with a Jap engine. Okay. Now, whether or not there would be such cohesion these days between <laughs> yeah. two rival manufacturers, I, I don't know. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of history out there on how that all came about. I mean, Victor Martin uh, uh, was basically an extension of the Jap factory. Oh, okay. It was based around a corner in Tottenham. Yep. And uh, this, again, would have been one of the very early uh, Speedway engine developments. Um, I think Wall Handley worked on that. Um, yep. in the development and I think also Bert Levac may have had some influence as well with yep. the early so well Jap with, that. Um, with the early Jap uh, Speedway engines but I mean the thing about both of these bikes I don't know about you John but I just love the originality the fact that they're untouched this conforms to catalogue specification again okay. Richard Forshaw being the man that he was had a copy of the catalogue yep. and this motorcycle is correct right down to the original tyres in actual fact, the story is that it was found under a stairs in Lancashire um, and it hadn't been used from 1935. So it sat there from 1935 to the point where the house was cleared. Um, and Richard went and bought it from, it was a caravan park, I, I believe, where it had sort of then wound up after the house had been, contents of the house had been cleared um, and brought it back to the collection. Of course, it's done absolutely the right thing in not being tempted to restore or touch it. And likewise with that Rudge, uh, it's just marvellous. Frozen in time, just yeah. <laughs> left as they were, oh, no. particularly this one. I mean, yeah. it looks like it was raced at the weekend and, and then been put away. But it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, very interesting. And lots more detail of these in terms of the history of them then on the website. Yeah, the history catalog. on the website, high resolution images. People will be able to zoom right in on the detail and um, pick up all the lovely little nuances with, with each of these motorcycles. Incredible. And the estimate on the Victor Martin is eight to 14,000 pounds, and the estimate on the Rogers are not dissimilar, eight to 12,000 pounds. So now we're joined by Dave, who works here at the museum. And um, Dave, you've been involved with the collection a number of years now. Yes, I've been here for four years as a Haynes Collection volunteer. Um, prior to that, I was employed uh, in a local family company, Talon Engineering for 43 years. Okay. So it's how I built up a lot of my information on speedway racing. Um, I had the privilege to work and sell equipment to league riders, world champions from 76 onwards. Uh, yeah. And a really great employment time for me with a good company and my knowledge has been brought forward now to the Haynes Museum collection. And what an honour it must be to, to work with these bikes and some of these fantastic post-war machines. It really is good, yes. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah the post-war machine. Ben obviously has done a, a really good job talking about the uh, pre-war and early part of the collection. But we mustn't forget some of the more modern machines, some of which are quite famous and have had equally famous riders. 
And this one in particular is one we want to focus on now then. This one in particular is one of my personal favourites uh, because I still have strong connections with the rider. <clears throat> this machine was owned by Peter Collins, 1976 World Speedway Champion. Wow. Yep. Um, we work with Peter a lot uh, in my employment. This is a 1977 machine of his, I believe. Uh, antique frame, Westlake engine, the Westlake engine being built by Bill Davis at Rye in Sussex. Um, altogether, a really nice standard machine. Upright engine, um, a little plug for Talon as well. It's still got some of our equipment on it. Oh, which there is you go. Nice. You had your magic touch on there as well, <laughs> yeah, then, Dave. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's one of my favourite modern bikes in the collection. Excellent. And uh, yeah. It really hope, stands out with its Union Jack livery it's, on there as well. You can't miss it. It's got the one. glitter guards on there, yes, which are famous at the time. Um, and I hope in the auction it goes to a deserved owner. Uh, if I go to the auction, I'm going to have to keep my hands firmly behind my back. <laughs> OK, so moving from the British machine to a, a European bike here, 1960s machine? Yes, 1968, 500cc from Czech Republic, the Jawa factory. Um, this machine, another favourite of mine because of its dead originality. Right. Um, as it came out of the Jawa factory. Um, lovely original machine, two-valve upright Jawa, banana seat, very, very popular in the 60s. Um, a virtually unburstable engine in terms yeah. of speedway racing. Didn't require much servicing. So very, very popular with the riders. All in all, a good sound machine. So these sort of bikes would have been bought by riders back in the day. With the, with the Jawa in particular, was it quite an easy bike to maintain? Popular from a maintenance point of view? They, they were, yes. Very, yeah. very, very easy to maintain. Very easy to work on. And... Generally, as speedway engines go, very, very reliable. Excellent. So from 1968 to the most modern machine in the collection. Yes. We're going to have a look at that one. Yeah, we're going to have a look at that one. So a 1985 machine now then, Dave. Yeah, I'm not exactly certain that's 100% correct, 85, but somewhere around that okay. period. Um, we've moved on from the upright style of engine yep. now to the more popular laydown configuration. The, these engines were produced and mounted in a frame like that to uh, lower the centre of gravity, and that is how current machines are to this very day. This machine is almost similar to any machine that a rider would use now. Wow, yeah. um, the only difference being we don't have the fancy engine covers on this one, where the, the riders like to display their various uh, sponsors' names and logos. But um, apart from having some more up-to-date uh, wheels and things uh, and a slightly modern, more suspension form, uh, it is pretty much what the riders use today. Uh, single cylinder, 500cc, yep. uh, producing about 85 brake horsepower. Wow. OK. And total machine weight of somewhere in the region of 78 kilos. So power so to weight ratio is... You have got a superb <laughs> power to yeah. weight ratio. And a machine like this would probably still keep up with a Formula One car from 0 to 60. Wow. Obviously, Formula One has advanced so much these days, but this machine would be capable of 0 to 60 in three seconds. Fabulous. All mechanical, all analogue, whatever you want to call it but it still goes like the clappers. It still goes pretty well. <laughs> it's, it's um, you know, a scary ride, no doubt. <laughs> oh, exciting, though. No, brilliant. Thanks for your time, Dave. No problem. No, it's been a pleasure. It's been a genuine privilege, Ben, to see the Foreshore collection here at the Haynes Motor Museum, and, you know, it's, it's going to be an incredible sight to see them in auction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think hopefully it'll be a real testament to what Richard has achieved. Uh, it's a really wonderful collection of motorcycles and it's only going to be on view at the museum for a very short period of time. Um, wonderful also to have Dave talking about the motorcycles, the man who's really sort of been the custodian of them and looking after them for the last four years. And he's going to be giving uh, talks on the collection throughout September, uh, every Friday. Okay. So take that opportunity to come and see yeah. him speak about these machines before that opportunity is gone. Yeah, well worth a visit. And the dates for the auction itself? We'll be on view on the 15th of October, okay. and the sale date is the 16th of October. The catalogue will be up ASAP, full descriptions, 
high-res images, yep. all the details that you need to know to come and view the bikes, register for the sale, so on and so forth. Read the small print, make sure you've got everything that you need when you come to the sale. And um, fingers crossed these all go to new loving homes. I'm sure they will, and we look forward to seeing you at the sale. See you there.